with hearing from Paul Mason to my left, um, who I'm sure you all know is the economics editor of Newsnight and the author of a number of books, including Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere. I need to say at this point that despite Paul being here, he is apolitical and doesn't support any of the activist groups directly involved. Um, with permission from you, I would like to spend the first 20 minutes of the session just in a Q&A with him and then ask the panel to respond. And I'll start with the panel. Um, it will be Spiro Lumnos, who is from Occupy, which fights for social and economic equality and was heavily involved, as I'm sure you will know, in the student protests and anti-austerity protests in the last year or two. Um, then we've got Danny Pafford um, from UK Uncut, which has been working against tax avoidance and fighting the austerity measures. We've also got Adam Ramsey, who's been a Green Party Council candidate and is now a grassroots activist for the party. And we also have Marie Campbell, who's campaigns manager at the online campaigning group 38 Degrees. Um, I'll ask them to speak for no more than a couple of minutes each after Paul and I have spoken, and then I'd like to spend the entire second half of the session, which will be 45 minutes, delivering it straight to the floor so that you guys can have a chance to raise as many questions and comments as you would like. Um, so if that all sounds okay, um, I'd like to start by talking to Paul. And Paul, uh, have, you got a, have you got a mic there? Yes, yeah. All right. Because I know your book is global in scope, but it'd be good to start with here in the UK um, and keep it here and tell us what you think are the particular strengths and achievements of the modern UK protest movement. Well, um, thank you, Rainer, and uh, thanks to the panel for... Um, I didn't realise I was going to be interviewed like this, <laughs> but um, sorry to... Um, I, will, I mean, look, the first thing I'll say is uh, in... Um, I think it's coming out in The Guardian next week. I'm, I've done an introduction to a series they're doing about what's happened to graduates and, and what's that, partly about protest and partly about social issues facing this, you know, the graduates without a future, as I call them. And in it, I just, I've written something which I just wanted to kind of sort of remind everybody else about. It, it, it's a bit sickening to me to watch a generation of people who are anti-leadership for very good reason have to sit and listen to a bunch of grey bearded old men tell them uh, what they're supposed to be doing because the current structure of what's going on is that the leaderlessness and horizontality of a lot of the movements which I respect um, seems to leave us without um, an ability to sort of I, one, you don't want intellectual leaders, you don't want intellectuals, you don't want uh, a bunch of men you know, dominating all discussions. But what it does is it leaves, I mean, I, all right, at least I haven't got a grey beard, okay? But it does leave people who've, you know, written books, become professors, you know, can walk into a New York pub like David Harvey and they clear tables for him. You know, it leaves that generation setting the agenda. And, and so, it, much as I welcome the ability to talk to you for 20 minutes, I would actually say one thing we probably should do is try and, is try and find ways that facilitate the key arguments, and let's try and do it in this discussion, the key arguments coming out and being properly articulated against every, each other. So having said that, I mean, I think, look, the strength, as a, as a journalist covering this, the one thing uh, that I think has, that, that there is one movement that stands out as having had an impact, way, A, way above its uh, size, and B, an impact in a sort of exemplary way that, that showed other parts of mo movements and, and cultures what could be done, and that is UK Uncut. Because of all, all right, anti, stop the war, put a million people on the streets. Uh, it didn't stop the war. Uh, it probably made other wars impossible, uh, and we may or may not regret that when we see what wars are on the table in the next 10, 15 years. But, um, you know, March 26th, November 30th, massive trade union demos, what did they do? Uh, UK Uncut started, and I followed its, its evolution quite closely, um, with one action. Within about three or four weeks, there were 70 actions going on, some of them in places where the UK Uncut people had never heard of. And so it was a self-replicating thing, and what did it do? It changed the agenda. And so you could say there are billions more pounds going to UK Exchequer right now because companies have become terrified of having their branches invaded by 
not particularly radical people, because it, by the sort of fourth or fifth week, you will correct me because you may have known more of the detail of it, you, you, know, you know, getting grandmothers in Cardiff going in with their granddaughters, or in Carlisle, you know, and, and just invading an HSBC or a Vodafone. That, to me, changed the game. And it was very interesting that when I was researching the book, I, in my mind, it, it, it had been the students in the occupations had gone and joined Uncut. Actually, when you look at the sequencing of it, it's the other way around. Uncut precedes the, big stu the biggest of the student demos, both the day to X plus one and X plus two. And so that's very interesting. And we, uh, when we hear from the uncut people, I'd, I'd be very interested to see where that goes. Now, obviously, one of the, just to finish, what the downside of it is, and I always have this argument with people involved in horizontalist movements, is what, what you inevitably then get is reform by riot. What I mean by that, and it's an old British tradition, is a bloke in a hoodie goes to jail for two years uh, so that somebody in a suit can pass a slightly more radical law. And that is the weakness of it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I think, sorry, we'll have questions later. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear why you think that the movement against tax avoidance has had more success than the movement against um, austerity measures. And I think one thing that's been quite interesting is that despite this huge um, rise of UK protest movements and the colour of it and the excitement of it and the media coverage, a sustained movement against austerity has not arrived. Do you think that's because UK uncut tactics were just more effective than the Occupy measures or is that something deeper? Well, I think the, the, the first thing is, is that the austerity is backloaded. Remember, Osborne's programme is it's a backloaded austerity. Then most of the cuts come next year, the year after, and then two years after the next election. It's something that the right wing of the Conservative Party is very vocal about, that they don't think there is any austerity. Now, I think there is austerity, obviously, but it isn't, it isn't Greek-style or Spanish-style austerity yet. That's the first thing. I think the other thing, let me observe this. Is I think only a journalist can say this, because sometimes you're too polite to say it to each other. To me, there are, re there are three circles in the UK, as it were, horizontalist movement. Four, I'll, 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 I'll be really, really <laughs> precise. No. One circle is a, a, people who uh, have been to climate camp, have been, you know, done a lot of training on how to, you know, take a, a Coke can up to the fence of um, a power station by night and then removed it without anybody noticing as training to do stuff. Um, been to Gaza, um, been in the clone army and are, you know, horizontalist or anarchists or whatever and they're very, you know, uh, experienced protesters and they know what their project is, okay? Then I think Uncut was an, one of those overlapping Venn diagrams with them, but with much more newer people who, some came from a sort of anarchist or autonomous direction, some are left social democrats, some are in NGOs, some are union activists. Um, and then Occupy LSX I think was a much more interesting thing because sociologically, from day one, which I was at when Assange turned up, it was very much sort of those two circles. A third set of people came along, and it, it was a mixture of street people or people who were quite dispossessed and felt they had no voice. Um, and it, I, I think my observation is that those three circles are still quite, three quite distinct projects. Um, and above all, the more veteran people uh, the clone army, climate camp, you know, King's North Power Station type people have, have not massively committed to the other two in any great numbers because they don't necessarily share the project. Now, if you go to New York in, with Occupy, which I was on earlier in the year, there's a different thing going on there. Occupy got a lot of, a big sociologically diverse group of young people, educated young radical people, got them together for several weeks and now, of course, they've all gone on and done their different thing. So I can say Spain is very similar as well, except that was millions of people. And what both Occupy New York have done and Occupy in Spain is that they are now very deeply rooted into social movements of oppressed and poor people. Because once they got dispersed, they said, what do we do? Let's go to the poor. A bit like the Neurodniks in Russia in the 1890s. And they have, if you go to... You know, in, in Seville, I found this... Um, these, these poor, very poor working class families <laughs> occupying a tower block. And, but actually at the doorway, doing the guarding, doing the cooking, doing the organising, the legal work, were occupied people. And I think that 
I'm not sure what's happened to the UK movement. Um, it, so I don't know whether that's a weakness or a strength, but it certainly hasn't done yet this fragmenting, cascading into them, as it were, mm. the populace. Mm. That was completely preempting my next question, which was, in the UK, do you think it's a valid criticism to say that it's not sociologically diverse enough? I mean, you use the terms here, young and educated, and certainly, in my experience, it does seem to be led mostly well, yeah. by those people. Yeah, I mean, look, well, well, look, no, I don't know whether it's not socially diverse enough. I think Occupy London, London Stock Exchange was very socially diverse. When I went to it, you know, you had city people coming along, you had bankers, you had people who were not particularly leftist, actually. What was the interesting thing about Occupy London Stock Exchange is it tended to develop a, quite a libertarian critique of capitalism. Mm -hmm. you know, they weren't joking when they said that Hayek was anti-capitalist and all this uh, stuff, which to me is slightly uh, rubbish. Um, but um, the, um, the, uh, the the but it's not it's not the sociologically diverseness. I mean, look, we're in the very fact that we were discussing this in Congress House with the Jacob Epstein's great sort of um, hidden uh, hidden statue of the of the Christ below us that the TUC didn't like because it was too modern, um, so they hid it just down there. Um, the, the very fact that we're doing this in a trade union place uh, shows you that the, the weight and, of numbers of trade unionism and labourism in Britain is always going to be very big. Mm. Um, in a way that, you know, in, 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 you know uh, again, if you look at the Spanish land workers I met who were occupying a, a, an abandoned farm, again with a good smattering of sort of anarchist activists with them, um, when you ask about the political roots and traditions of those Spanish land workers, the one thing they say is we hate socialism. We hate the Socialist Party. We hate. We have our own trade union, but we hate the other trade unions because they're too reformist. So there's a kind of sociology of revolt in, in places where Occupy has been mass. Spain is a good example there. You could say America as well. America now, Occupy movement, very, very uh, quickly started to meld in with the Trayvon Martin campaign. Uh, and tra I saw more than 10,000 black youth just go on the streets in Detroit for Trayvon, uh, quietly, under, or, you know, very orderly, occupy people at the edges, trying to support them. You know, we've, just, we've got this very sort of stable and staid labour movement. And I think, I don't know whether you may tell me, the, the activists, how that plays, you know, how it plays. Obviously, we saw on the famous March demo, I mean, I think a bit of a catastrophe. It's the first time I've ever seen the most left-wing people in society, or self-designated, voluntarily run away from a million workers mm. uh, on the street and yeah. run somewhere else and do something else. Okay. But they chose to do that. So that leads quite nicely into my next question, which was, I'm interested to hear how you think UK activism has changed um, in the more recent years. And it strikes me that I've just been thinking about it, that the generation that's protesting now is very much a generation that wants into the club. It doesn't want to overthrow the club. It wants to be able to go to university and get a good job and work really hard and provide mm. for the family. It doesn't want, uh, in that sense, a radical revolution. Um, can you maybe yeah, say well, the only problem is, is that capitalism is not capable of de delivering any of it, <laughs> so that they might be much less radical than the 68 generation or the new left generation. I don't necessarily think they are, but let's accept that they are, uh, that the 68 generation got given free education and an, an upward curve of life for 20 years until Thatcherism came along. Um, this generation, it can't, you know, work hard. What did that, occupy, that, that, that manifesto of the... Uh, Santa Cruz students say it was called communicate for an absent future it's work hard play hard for what to, the right to you know basically um, draw hearts on cappuccino foam you get a degree to get a job but the job you get once you got the degree is the job you did while you're trying to get the degree that's mm -hmm. modern capitalism that's why mm -hmm. despite this sort of, I, mean, I, I wouldn't say and I am from a different generation I'm from a generation brought up very much in a tradition of you know um, laborism uh, solidarity, class, etc., where individual choice and I want cream on my cappuccino was almost morally wrong to my father's generation. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, why? Because that's what weakens the only thing you have in life, which is solidarity. And if you want to go and be me too, egotist, choosing this, that and the other, and I don't want to commit, that, that was seen as alien. Now, I'm a union organiser at the BBC for the NUJ, and, I and yeah, my biggest problem is getting young people to join the union. I don't want to, can't afford it, why should I? What can it do for me? Whereas people of my generation go, yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. 
I understand why. Now, I'm not angry with them, I understand, because I understand that they are products of 20 years of relentless, frankly, bullshit about personal and individual choice. That's fine. But the problem is it can't deliver the choices anymore. For, in, for one in two people in Spain, young people, the choice is nothing, because they're on the dole. So I think I, I, the radicalism... The, the difference between the generations is, is this, and I've written about it in the book. We are dealing now with almost different kinds of individuals. We're dealing with, you know, the, in, the generation of workers that experienced the first years of mass production and mass consumption were very different lifestyle-wise to their fathers and mothers. So I'm talking about people who saw the first cinema, people who saw the first cars, got on the first trams. Yeah, they went on the first holidays to Blackpool. They, what did they do on those holidays to Blackpool? Uh, things that their mothers thought were immoral. Yeah? So they lived different lifestyles. Um, this is true for, for now. And, and I think that you, live, you, you make progress out of the people who are there and angry about things. And therefore, networks is what we're talking about here. Horizontality, the swarm, the hive mind, the networked individual, the increased footprint of individual issues in, in campaigns are you have to live with them and I'll finish on this when, when I was a young uh, activist in you know, trade unions and, and, and the left which is publicly knowledge that I was before I went in the BBC and became non-political uh, <laughs> uh, which you have to do and one has to respect but when I was an activist I, my project was to be a, a lever on a big boulder and the boulder was the labour movement. And the lever were all those little groups with their newspapers. And what we were trying to do, which was to pull the, make the boulder move. And it never moved, really. Uh, once, it, minor strike, printer strike, it moved a bit. Um, if I was doing it now, it, I would just be, become a little stone and start rolling. That's the difference with now. That's the, that, that's the only form of activism that would work. Yep. Um, just one final question, because I'm sure that the rest of the panellists are dying to come in, and the audience as well. Um, given we are living in this individualistic, consumerist culture, where is this UK protest movement going, do you think? Do you think it can shift that stone? Well, I think there's another thing happening. Uh, um, the UK... What, what, right, obviously you know I've been covering Greece a lot in the last few... Well, the last few years, but I've been backwards and forwards and there, you know, a lot in the last few months. Um, and there we've seen the rise of a, of a new, um, effectively left social democratic party, uh, Syriza. Um, not unlike Die Linke in Germany, uh, not unlike the United Left in Poland, and, sorry, in Portugal. Um, th there's nothing, there is really nothing like that here. Uh, so that's the, the first observation to make. And since there isn't, I mean, I suppose the, the, the question I think is posed for all the activists, even people as successful, say, as 38 Degrees have been with your stuff, is, you know, when it comes down to it, you, there are situations which only parties and parliamentary action, and, and even things beyond parliamentary action, like what do you do about the riot police who are out of control, riddled with drug dealers and fascists, what do you do about them? Well, there's no amount of anarchist squats, nor even anarchist barricades in Athens, can, can actually solve the problem of what's happening with the Greek riot police. So you have to be in power. And you then have to decide whether the traditional parties that you've supported, social democracy, PASOK, are capable of doing stuff. The vast majority of young people on the left in Greece have decided not. They've quit. And PASOK's Caders are now leaving. You know, their, their equivalents of the Damien McBride, you know, their spin doctors are leaving and going over to Syriza. Um, autonomism and anarchism and horizontalism in Athens is in retreat. Uh, people I've spoken to are terrified of being attacked by the fascists, terrified that they're going to be broken up by the, the riot cops who are in league with the fascists. It, the, 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 I mean, you read a history book, you know, it's dealing with fascism is a job of organization and um, if you're against and, and you know we about half the Greek population is against the austerity then you know you can't stop the austerity without doing something to the austerity program of the government and the, to that one answer one quite simple way which circumvents a lot of barricades and, and demos is to be the government so I think that the, the question for the British 
trade union movement to the left, the horizontalists, the anarchists, is what's your attitude towards social democracy? Can it be made to do at least some of the things you think it can? Or, or if not, then what are you going to do about it? I mean, Greens, obviously, you're advancing. You're, you've been, you stood for the Green Party. But on an arithmetic basis, it's going to take you a long time to get to even where Syriza was before the crisis started. Mm -hmm. I think that is the question facing most developed world sort of youth and activist movements. Uh, and, and I know, actually, I, I said about these three circles of activists, I know that is big in their minds. I know that they, that they worry about reform by riot, and they, they do <coughs> ask themselves, how do they relate to the big power blocks that they have broken away from? That's fascinating, thank you. I think that's a perfect moment to bring in uh, Danny from UK Uncut. Um, perhaps you could, you've been told here from Paul that you were one of the best examples of the horizontal movement there. So perhaps you can pick up and talk about your experience on that. And also Paul's question about whether and how you support social democracy. Right, okay. <laughs> put that in too. Um, okay, so Uncut. Yeah, um, it was really successful. Um, and it was, it, it took those tactics of direct action that people, um, so I was one of a group of, the group of friends that, that took those tactics from the climate movement and kind of applied them to kickstart anti-austerity, um, which was really effective. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that kind of high adrenaline, media grabbing, constantly needing to escalate uh, kind of tactic actually lasted for kind of longer than... Um, longer than we thought and was more sustainable than we realised just because of the nature that it adapted to people's lives and it was it was a template that people could use um, you know in their own time on their own high street but whenever it worked for them but yeah we have now got to this point where we are we are reanalyzing what you know what the next thing is the big kind of uh, you know from the from the point you know a year ago when we had you know every single weekend for months and months and months hundreds of people on the high streets in shops. I mean, that hasn't happened for a while. Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, how important is that we've create this platform around tax avoidance has been, has been quite effectively created and that dialogue is moving forward. Uh, and I think, so what we're, I guess, so the things that seem to be happening now are, um, first of all, this, this realization of the kind of short-termism of, of, of that type of protest and how we're how we're going to deal with that and at the moment skill shares is kind of is that intermediate tool that activists kind of understand uh, and that can be linked into the trade union movement so one of the things um, going forward is uh, so there was some skill shares done around the country uh, before the last action which was the street party um, at Nick Clegg's house uh, and <laughs> going forward, there's going to be a kind of Skillshare program with unions ahead of the next big um, action on October 20th. Um, so there's an, there's an attempt there to, to recognise that you do need more, you do need more structure if, if it's going to be sustainable um, and, and how, we, how we create that. Um, and then, then there's the second, you know, the second barrier we came up against was how do you, how do you look at this, this positive, this positive message? How do you get beyond just like don't avoid your tax? How, how do you kind of re, like reinvent that collectivism which we have so lost? And I think it's, you know, the, the particular kind of bit of uncut that I'm involved in, obviously it's like an autonomous network, so I can only speak from my experience, is, uh, we are very acutely aware of the fact that we're completely Kind of disenfranchised a lot of us with, with kind of, the current political situation, um, and and kind of how do we how do we re-engage with that? Um, what was I had another thought? That's, it's great. We can come back to you if you okay. So yeah, if we right. do that as well, because I think um, it's quite an interesting time to bring in Spira, who's from uh, Occupy, and maybe Spira, if you talk a little bit about. Um, some of the challenges that you faced in building a horizontal movement against austerity as well, mm. and what maybe you could or couldn't learn from UK Uncut? Um, I think the biggest challenge at the moment is uh, that Occupy <laughs> was really tied to a physical space, um, which we don't have at the moment. Mm. Um, and um, 
so uh, I think it would be really interesting to see how we could uh, reproduce this space uh, using new technologies, um, trying to, um, for example, um, uh, I mean, the structure of Occupy is based, you know, it's, uh, it's based around the General Assembly, which is where all the decisions are, are made. So, um, for example, a solution to it would be to, to see how we could reproduce that online and give the, the, the opportunity for more people to, 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 to engage. Um, at the moment, um, apart from um, um, temporary occupations, I don't see um, anything uh, similar to what happened at St. Paul's happening again. Um, there was an effort, also the police are changing their tactics as well, they have become more violent. On the 12th of May, for example, we had a very violent reaction from the police. Uh, it is very clear that it's not going to happen again, so we have to, we have to change our tactics and we have to, to find different ways of um, uh, engaging people. Um, now another, um, yeah, I think, I think that, that these are the, the main challenges that we're facing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Adam Ramsey, can I ask if you'd come in and perhaps give us some perspective? You're an interesting perspective because you're a grassroots activist for a Green Party that sits somewhere in the middle between mainstream politics and activism. Perhaps you can give us what, some of your thoughts. Um, sure. Um, I mean, probably most of my thoughts don't particularly relate to the party I'm a member of um, and more to um, other things. I mean, for me, um, a lot of people are concerned at the moment about you know the, the drifting of the movement there was. Um, I'm not enormously, I always, I've always sort of felt that movements are quite like perennial flowers and that every, every few months, every year or so, you get these amazing visual protests and so on and what actually matters, as any gardener knows, is that the roots grow and they're nurtured properly. And so the question for us isn't when are the next flowers going to bloom, the question is how do we nurture the roots. And I think that that's been happening a bit and as, as Danny says, there's been um, in, an increasing realisation of that and investment in that, so there have been more attempts at skill sharing, at training, and so on, and we need to, um, we need to build more capacity there. I, I also think, though, that, um, that one of the things that's interesting about the shape of the UK movement is how focused it is around very specific tactics, and how those tactics are very much about what I always think of as the first thing that you need to do with activists, which is getting some people together. So whether that's uncut, getting people together in a shop in a very public, visible way, or whether that's Occupy, getting people together in space outside the stock exchange. It's always just that first stage. You go get people together, and then you wait for the corporate press to tell people about it. And, of course, we all know that you're never going to beat corporate power through the pages of the corporate press. And so, for me, the real challenge is going to be the, the next stage, which is once you've got people together, you then get them to go out and get more people. And you go to where people are, and you organise. And in a sense, that's why I'm interested in party politics. I, I kind of realise that though I'd like the Green Party to be in government in the next few years, there's quite a good chance that's not going to happen in my lifetime. We shall see. But one thing that elections do force me to do and do force you to do is go and knock on doors. And so I spend you know, a good few months every year up to May before elections going and banging on doors in wherever people happen to be standing. But it gives you a great perspective on what people are thinking and on how to organise people and how to get them together and how to speak the language that people are speaking and that helps enormously in all the other tactics that we use in, in the occupations and the protests and so on. So for me, um, yes, the Green Party is um, a tactic and the standing in elections is a tactic and that's useful and sometimes you win and yes, ultimately you aim to be in government and the party itself has you know, strategic questions at the moment as to what direction we're going in but, but for me the interesting question is what are the different tactics we can use when standing up against the attempt to use the flailing capital, the, the, the kind of general collapse of the system as was. What, system, what, what tactics can we use to organise to ensure the system which replaces it is a better rather than a worse one or a continuation of the same one um, as was? And, uh, and yeah, the party's a part of that, but I don't, I don't mm. think it's the only one. Brilliant, thank you. One thing we haven't talked very much about is the role of social media um, in how that's affecting protest movements in the UK now. Um, so it'd be really good, perhaps, if Marie Campbell from 38 Degrees could talk a bit about that and the work her organisation's doing. Sure. Um, a little bit. Thanks. It's, it's Marie, the Scottish version. Not Marie, but that's oh, everyone does it. It's fine. Um, people often want me to talk about social media uh, because it's, it's kind of um, one of the ways, I guess, that we've grown our movement really fast to kind of more than a million members. But actually, emails, it's kind of... Um, 
has been a much kind of quicker growth mechanism than Facebook or Twitter. We find that email sharing is vastly more powerful. Um, to talk a wee bit about 38 degrees um, and answer some of those questions around kind of the challenges of horizontality um, and, and uh, whether and how we support social democracy, I think a place to start is that, is that stop the war, a million people on the streets. I think that was one of the kind of many kind of triggers that were floating around in the ether that led to the setting up of 38 degrees about three years ago, um, although that was before my time. Uh, the sense that a million people got onto the streets, but the war still went ahead. And what would you have done if we had a million people's email addresses and we could have gone back out to them and said, and now let's all go and you know, knock on the doors of our MPs' offices and now let's all coalesce in this one space at one time. So I think that was one of the reasons 38 Degrees was, was set up to address that problem. Um, it's very much kind of based on actually quite a traditional model coming out of the 60s of local community organising, and um, uh, but something that's kind of scalable. So that means that it's member driven, which is that kind of horizontality. It's this idea that unless we're doing all together what most of us kind of want us to do, then it's just never going to develop or go anywhere. And we're working across different issues because uh, that means that we can involve more people um, more of the time. Um, and yeah, with this horizontality question, it is kind of trying to strike that balance between being absolutely genuinely member led and asking that question every 10 minutes in the office. What would the members want us to do now? Um, and also the fact that we do have an office with professional organisers that are there and that we're also looking to kind of spot those moments and those opportunities when we can put our members' kind of interest into action. Um, and I guess the question of kind of what's next and, and how, do we, how do we take it forward? It's been around for three years. Um, a lot of that time has been kind of growing and building our capacity, so developing new tactics, new capabilities, how we organise offline and stuff like that and how we fundraise. Um, there's been some big victories in that time, kind of on forests and big changes to the NHS. The question of what's next and how we support social democracy, the answer is, I don't really know. <laughs> I basically spend my day kind of building or helping to build with loads of other people this really increasingly very powerful machine um, that we don't have an answer to what it's for because the answer to what it's for will change and the answer will come from a million people plus out there in the UK. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up to the floor now for the last 45 minutes of the session. But one thing I will just say for our panellists to think about, if I may, um, when you're coming back to your other remarks, perhaps in the very end, is I'm still struck by the fact that I'm, I'm now a councillor in local government and I have institutions and structures and regular meeting times and registers to organise change. Yeah? And when I hear about what's happening in these other movements, I almost get itchy with frustration because I, maybe I'm a control freak. Um, but the fact is that I still don't see you know, how you get over this problem of horizontality, not having um, a sense of stability, not having um, those institutions there. And if you could just give me one practical example before we leave of how you overcome some of that challenges, either from your direct experience or a way that you think might be able to work or help, I think that would be really helpful, not just for me, but for anyone else in the room who is thinking about taking away some lessons from the session as well. Um, but yes, let's open. And please, I'm going to take a number of contributions. Fantastic. We're really active. So this gentleman at the front, the gentleman over there, and the gentleman over there. Is that right to start with? Uh, hi there. Um, my question is actually mainly to Paul, but also to Rowena, because I, I think Morris has talked about this a lot, which is that... Sorry, could you just introduce yourself, sir? Uh, uh, Sam Wheeler of, um, well, myself, and also Unite, vaguely. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my question is that, because Paul, you talked about how young people don't actually trust leaders. Isn't the flip side of that, that actually the leaders of the left in the widest possible sense in Britain have never actually trusted the great mass of people in the country. They have constantly sort of viewed their own core vote, their own core demographic, the mass of people, as homophobic, bigoted, racist, in other ways entirely detached from this sort of very middle class, very metropolitan viewpoint. And therefore, they in many ways not wanted to engage with them, preferring judicial activism, pre pre you know, preferring doing things in a much less democratic way. And it's only now, after sort of 20, 30 years of entirely rejecting <coughs> that democratic way of going about things, that it's become so difficult to actually interact with the British public at large. Brilliant, thanks. There's a gentleman over 
I just wonder if the panel could speak a little bit where you think the kind of London citizens movement fits into this, because they're obviously uh, a movement that's been growing quite a lot over the last couple of years, um, applying some of the same tactics, and I'd be love to just get your reflections on where they fit in this e evolving ecosystem of protest movements. That's great. And there was a gentleman at the back there. Hi, John Nugent, Voice Register. Um, Paul, you said that you have to be the government for change, uh, which is uh, obviously a really good place to be if you want to affect change, and, and movements are all about trying to influence the government, I guess, to do that, um, which would imply that you know, there are a lot of um, uh, ideas and, and issues that the common people want so that the government doesn't do, so the government doesn't reflect uh, the needs and wants of the people very effectively which would imply that the democratic process perhaps is in need of reform. Um, you know, I'd, my question to the panel is, if there was one thing that you could change about the current democratic process, how it mm. works, um, to make uh, the government more representative of the people, um, what, what would it be? Mm. Nice question, thank you. Um, there's a gentleman over here. Good morning, um, George Bell. I'm an activist uh, pensioner, but I'm also an activist in the Open University Students Association. Just picking up on a couple of themes that came from the general debate down below. There were two things that were mentioned. One was the ownership of the media that we use, and the other one was that a lot of very young people um, use this media. I think my interest really is in intergenerational activism because if you look at the two people who've been affected by the coalition policies, you find that they're young people and old people. You've got grandparents and grand um, sons and daughters who could actually be in opposition to each other if the social media actually causes a digital divide. It doesn't have to be that way because many uh, um, of the activist pensioners have an awful lot of time in their hand and have a very powerful grey vote. But it does seem to be neglected. Um, and that sort of connection needs to be thought about, particularly on online social activity. Now, as an open university student, it's not a problem because that's what we do. Um, it's not like the sort of face-to-face -face experience that um, you get in other universities. We are active online. One of the problems I find, and I think this applies to Occupy, is there is a dilemma here. The dilemma to me is that the paradox of organization of grassroots is that we're commodifying um, the whole process. And as we go along, and as we get further into this process, we're talking about a commodity here. Now, Occupy asked the question at St. Paul's, what would Jesus think? If they had said, what would Marx have thought? They might have thought that Marx might say, hey guys, you're part of a commodification process here of protest. And if you don't think far enough ahead, you'll find that this will be an industry. Now, somebody mentioned Trayvon Martin there. Now, if you look at the June edition of Time, it talks about one of the websites called change.org, which is a profitable petitioner site. You can make money by petitioning. Now, try and imagine a nap on your phone, like the ambulance chasers. Hey, guys, would you like to protest against something, because here we have is a group of people <laughs> that can actually help you. So they've actually monetized change.org. So that's an example of commodification. So I think these are issues that we need to think ahead about. Also, my difficulty is that I actually see the word as being absurd anyway. And I think there is a notion of over-analysis. Now, it could be that the media need that because that's what they do. But the word is absurd. And I'm just beginning to think, Christ, maybe I have something here in terms of um, online existentialism, you know, because I could have E, I could put a capital E in the existentialism. I think, I'm not trying to be too cynical about it, but I think the warning is that the more and more that we get involved in social media and the more and more the media itself um, collects into it, it's become a commodity, and we need to be careful that anarchism still on the streets, breaking windows, throwing bombs, it still might have a place um, in trying to change the world. I can think. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Rupa Hart. I'm a blogger, and like you...
end of the spectrum and go up for a complete critique or maybe like UK and cuts way in with a very specific one uh, and obviously if there is space for those how do they fit together most effectively that's brilliant thanks I mean, can I suggest that we just go back to the panel quickly now we would definitely have time for at least one more round I'd say <coughs> so you will get a chance to ask your questions um, I don't know if perhaps do you want to start Paul by um, responding to a number of those perhaps you can just choose a few so many. Don't know there's, so, there's, there's um, a lot well, I'll just say, what I think, um, uh, the cent this, is, this is what I think, the, the, I have a collective answer to a lot of what, what's been raised. Horizontal networking and swarming, and they're effective for modern networked individuals to use. People who actually can, uh, they, 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 you Rupert Murdoch called them digital natives, but you know, people who've grown up with this and have, that, have lived that life, it's a very effective way for them to to, to protest, um, especially against power that has no social roots. So, you know, technocratic government in Britain, whether it's the Labour or Tories or Liberals or the Metropolitan Police, the technocracy doesn't have social roots and legitimacy in the way that old conservatism and old Labourism and the old Met Police had. You know, you see a thief running down the street in London, you, you don't see ten, other, 10 members of the public running after them often. Uh, people just go, so what? Okay, now, now against that kind of power, networked power is quite powerful. Um, but what I've observed on my travels around the world is that when power has social roots, that's where you begin to see networked forms of organisation have to morph and react to the fact that there are masses of conservatives in Greece. There are masses, there are you know, tens of thousands of people voting fascist in Greece. You know, um, they can put people onto the streets. So when you're up against that, or in America, the Tea Party is bigger as a social movement than Occupy is. So what do you do? The anti-abortion movement is bigger than the pro-abortion movement. So that's where, you run, that's where the network thing runs into problems. And it has to then ask itself, all right, what are we going to do about these big, big Lego blocks that sit up there? Uh, do we want to move the Lego blocks of society around? And I think that is, the, that is what the British uh, social movements are, are trying to, to deal with um, and beyond. And just one other thing then about um, social movements, I think, will begin to evolve this tactic, they'll begin to see parties like Barcelona Football Club sees the ball. Because you know, ordinary sort of st stupid football is kick the ball towards the goal. That's what you do. Get the ball, kick it towards the goal. Barcelona Football Club is like this. The ball is, is our way of winning. Okay? Our only thing as 11 guys is to move that ball to, into this physical space over here in a particular way. We don't have any emotional attachment to the ball. We don't, we don't embody it with any great properties. You know, we, our job is it's simply a tool for us to move from here to there. And when we do, if we move it from there to there, we've won. Okay? And I think that is, it, it is a good metaphor for understanding how I see horizontal movers begin to relate to parties. Most people, most activists in, in Syriza, in Greece, are not in the party. You say, oh, how long have you been a member? Oh, I'm not a member. I'm not a member of the party. Um, I'm a member of another tiny group because um, I don't agree with them on XYZ. So I think that is the way it's going. And I think that we're approaching a, a, the kind of moment that the left approached in the early 30s, when for about four years after the Wall Street crash, a lot of leftism was about, you know, fantasy politics, you know, the communists said that Labour were fascist, yeah, uh, and they won't do it, have anything to do with them. And once they saw a million real fascists on the streets of Paris, Germans had already gone fascist, once they saw a million people supporting fascism on the streets of Paris, the left said, you know what, that other stuff that we've been going on about for four years isn't working, is it? We better do something else. What came out of it was, you know, you, social historians will know as the Popular Front, which had its own problems. But it was a, a moment of getting real for the left, where they realised what the stakes were. Thanks. Perhaps, Dami, do you want to come in as well and perhaps look at uh, Zoe's point about what objectives you should be pursuing after the news that we've heard this week as well? Uh, yeah, okay. I think um, this idea of kind of organising and how we organise and how you get around not having these, these they feel all very interrelated, not having structures and how do you integrate other movements. And I think a lot of, 
a lot of the problem with the actually the lot of the social movements that we have today is that they are slightly I mean particularly in the NGO world that is kind of commoditized and it is a kind of competition um, and they're they're people's activists and um, and I think because because people aren't part of because it feels like we're lacking an overall narrative that we buy into as as a movement and I think and I, I mean I don't know I'm, I'm of the generation that's been abandoned by trade unions I'm, I'm not a member and, and I don't get them um, and they, they seem very outdated but it felt like that you know as Paul was talking about gave this kind of collective <coughs> idea and kind of where, where do we get that from now we're all doing our kind of little little bits of stuff um, yeah and I mean, I guess on on yeah, Zoe stuff. I'm involved in the in the Move Your Money campaign as well. Um, which, on a side note, if anyone knows how to fix websites, um, if anyone in this room knows anyone that can use Heroku uh, or Ruby, that would be really useful because our website's gone down this morning, and I like to think it's because loads of people are moving their money as a result of well, you know, as a result of this week. But that's just a side point. Please speak to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and I suppose that was that came from what, the idea behind that was about kind of structures and where we uh, came from a frustration or lots of kind of campaigning on the banking that wasn't kind of going anywhere. And it feels like um, banking feels like it's got the biggest social root in this society of of anyone because it's you know this kind of uber consumerist, uber individualist, um, and. How do we change? How do we change the structures that are kind of perpetuating so many of the problems that we're seeing today? Um, and so that's, I mean, that's why um, I got involved in the in the Move Your Money um, project because I think it is about looking at the structures that support, you know, some of the big evils of today. And how do how do we build like a local banking sector? How do we ch how do we change the structures that are kind of perpetuating neoliberalism um, and you know increasing inequality? Um, and I think that's a uh, looking at the structures that we use um, and support is is a good next step for kind of activism. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I wonder if also Spiro could just come in now and um, talk to us a little bit more about um, Occupy, maybe again picking up on Zoe's question and maybe also looking at, I was interested in Rupa's question about whether you thought there was any similarity between the Arab Spring and some of the things that you were seeing in the Occupy movement. I think the, the question was about um, uh, the Arab Spring and the riots, which is oh, sorry, quite different. Mean, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I mean personally, I don't, I don't you know, I don't, obviously, I wouldn't compare um, the Arab Spring to um, to the riots. But however, you cannot neglect the fact that there was a political message in the riots, and um, it did reflect certain values. It did reflect values of uh, you know of consumerism. Um, um, so in that sense, yes, there is there are lessons to be learned uh, from the riots. Um, now, um, the other question was um, about Occupy with regarding the commodification. Was that right? Mm -hmm. What you asked, uh, which I'm not sure actually whether I uh, understood that question. Uh, but you mentioned the um, the banner. What would Jesus do? Uh, and um, you asked why. Uh, why the banner didn't say um, um, what what would Marx do? Is that what would Marx say? <clears throat> yeah, because well, first of all, that was you know um, it would be irrelevant in that particular moment, and it would be like opposing you know uh, Marxist uh, values to um, to everyone um, uh, at the time that this. Um, this dialogue started is when, when the church, uh, when St. Paul's Cathedral decided to close their doors, um, saying that they cannot operate the church. So um, um, the public opinion was quite positive. Um, but then when, uh, uh, obviously, when St. Paul's uh, decided to close the, um, their doors uh, um, uh, to the public and they said that they cannot operate, then obviously there was um, um, the, 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 uh, they, they tried to change the dialogue. Um, so people turned against Occupy. It's like, okay, yeah, we understand why you're there, but uh, you know, you shouldn't be uh, obstructing their cathedral's um, uh, operations. And we had loads of people uh, who were Christians, and they joined Occupy. Um, so yeah, I think um, in that sense, it was one of the greatest um, um, handling of PR crisis from Occupy because um, by questioning the church. Uh, what are they standing for? What are the values that they're standing for? Are they standing uh, 
uh, you know, for um, uh, equality or um, uh, or are they studying for um, um, you know together with their um, uh, with, the, with the people who fund St. Paul's Cathedral. So we dragged the church in that dialogue. So in that sense, no, I wouldn't say that it wasn't a successful um, um, message. Brilliant, thank you. And Adam, perhaps you could pick up, we haven't heard back um, from John's question about what change would you make to the democratic process? Perhaps you're quite apt to answer that one too. Um, <laughs> sure, I will. If, I might try and um, quickly run through a few of the questions, just yeah. I think people haven't had all those answered, if that's okay. Um, just on, and start with yours, um, which was, how do you overcome the lack of structure and horizontality? Um, I, in my day job, work for an organisation called People and Planet, which is a student activist network. And I spent the last week at our summer gathering, which is our sort of summer training camp for activists, for four days. And we've done that event for a number of years. Um, I was inside Fortnum and Mason during the fa famous protest there, and 35% of people there, I reckoned, had been to the People and Planet summer gathering. So the answer to the question, I think, is you build infrastructure, you bring people together, you train them, and then you set them free and go and let them do whatever they want. And that's how you build networks. It's put people together. You do need infrastructure, it doesn't just happen, but that infrastructure doesn't need to require you to tell them what to do. Um, I've also been involved in an organisation called Common People, reflecting back on what um, Paul was talking about, who ran the Sack Boris campaign. And what that managed to do was mobilise a good couple of hundred people to campaign in an election who weren't willing to join any political party. And I think that a lot of the time that's going to be the future, exactly as Paul talked about. Um, Young people don't trust leaders, leaders don't trust young people. Sam, I agree. I'm going to talk about Bolivia in a second in answer to another question, but I think that is key. Um, you asked, someone over there asked about uh, London citizens, and of course that's part of a much longer tra tradition, made famous by Saul Alinsky and, and many others. And again, I think that comes back to Sam's question, that I think in this country we've often seen ourselves, people who've been sitting in rooms like this, see themselves as potential political leaders as leaders or leaders of movements rather than as organisers of people. And I think that's particularly reflected in horizontalist anarchist movements where, yeah, people come together. They don't go and organise in their workplaces or on their streets or where they live. They just come together and sit around thinking they're great leaders of all these other people who think they're leaders. Um, change democratic processes. I'd start with either Tesco or the banks. Um, I think it's very easy to talk about election systems, and I love talking about election systems for hours on end. I'm a massive geek. But the main democratic deficit in this country, I think, isn't the election system, though that's a huge problem. The main democratic deficit is that we've handed almost all democratic control, things we used to have some kind of power over, to the private sector and often to huge corporations. And so whether that's food systems, which might be more locally democratically controlled, or financial systems, the main democratic deficit for me isn't how you make the decision, it's what you make decisions about. And we don't get to make decisions about almost all the things which you used to make decisions about. If I was my age, 40 years ago, my house would be illegal because there was some kind of democratic regulation of the rental market. Today we've lost that, and I think that those are the things we need to talk about when we talk about democracy. Um, uh, there was a question about commodification of protests, and I think, again, this is a really interesting generational point, that if you're my age, the main things you're told to do to resist is buy different stuff, is boycott Nestle, is buy this stuff, not that stuff. You're judged for what you buy, and you're told that your resistance should come through your dollar power. And we've got to get over that idea. That's a terrifying atomization of protests, and we're not as rich as them, so we're going to lose, because they've got more money. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Commodification of protests is, ter is terrifying, and I think it's defined. It's the final victory of Thatcher. It's defined almost all resistance for my generation. Um, quickly, were the rights political? Yes. Uh, you can't... Um, if you build a society in which people are so excluded from the process of creating it that they're willing to burn it down, then that's a political decision and those riots are a failure, if nothing else. I also went to Tottenham during the riots and they had very specific political demands there, but even if you ignore that, yes, the riots are obviously political because they demonstrate a failure to create political processes which include people. Um, and finally, Zoe, I just want to answer with a poll. On the first week of Occupy, um, I, I can't remember who it was that did the poll, it might have been um, Mori, I think, uh, but Maury, I think, um, asked, they did a poll in which they asked the question, there are currently anti-capitalist protests on the steps of St Paul's. Do you, A, support the protest, we need to switch to a system which puts people before profits, or B, believe the protesters are naive, we can only reform the system, we can't hope to change the whole system. 51% of people chose A, about 32% chose B. They didn't even ask the question, do you support the system as it is? <laughs> they didn't think that was worthwhile. So, yes, when we talk about systemic change, when we say the whole system isn't working, people agree with us. When we say 
you know, should we do this one specific thing? People are used to the arguments they get from the Tories about, about why they shouldn't. But when we say the system's at fault, that's the problem. Most people in this country agree with us. Thanks. And Marie, can you um, also just choose some questions to answer, but also maybe specifically looking at George's question about the digital divide, I'd be interested to know whether you thought that 38 degrees suffered from it. And another fact that completely shocked me, um, I know you said that you, you're talking less about social media, but one fact I heard the other day was that 25% of Facebook users earn £50,000 a year or more. Uh, and I thought that was absolutely a phenomenal statistic, um, and perhaps that's an, an evidence of another emerging digital divide that's there as well. It's a, it's a hell of a statistic. Um, yeah. I don't think any of my Facebook friends are earning £50,000 a year. Um, and interesting to know where that comes from. Yeah, so the digital divide. 38 degrees kind of campaigning model does start online. We certainly have aspirations to take it more and more offline. We've had lots of cool... Um, kind of events and things happening in, in forests during the forest campaign and hundreds of position hand-ins to MPs around the country so that is increasingly something we're doing but yeah it does tend to, you do, you do have to have an email address to be a 38 degrees member so um, I think fundamentally yeah, there's a challenge for us in our model and a question about um, how do we take that wider and kind of expand that if, if there's ways that we can do that in the future. Um, the kind of question of demographics that you raised around um, older folk and kind of younger folk, it's actually quite a common misconception that 38 Degrees is a, is a young person's movement. Um, our membership broadly mirrors the demographic of the UK, but it's actually, we're slightly underrepresented in the 18 to 25 year olds. I think that UK Uncut have done a much better job of kind of inspiring so far young folk to get involved. Um, that's something we're looking to address. Um, so I think that certainly whenever I go along to kind of a member's meal or a petition hand-in and things like that, it does tend to be older folk that, that I meet there. So that's just something that I would address as well. Um, other questions? London citizens, I'm a big fan. I really want to find out more about London citizens. I think they're doing um, some really fascinating work and maybe I'm hoping I can land a secondment or something, learn more about it. Um, I guess maybe the final question I would have a wee go at answering is this one around different organisations kind of working on the same issue, like banking and having different objectives and different organisational models and structures and, and how do they best fit together. Um, yeah, I think it's massively important that we talk to each other just a lot and all the time. I spend a lot of my time on the phone to lovely people like Danny and, uh, and stuff like that and trying to figure out kind of how what we're doing can work together. Um, there's definitely no one organisational model or system that has the answer to fixing our society's problems. And I think that this image that I think you use of a kind of an ecosystem of different orgs that have different aspirations and different objectives. And there doesn't have to be a grand plan about how that's all going to fit together. It's just we all need to kind of follow our, follow our impulses and, and our brains and, and, and stay true to what we, what we kind of believe in and what we're working on and keep talking. And I think that that's going to have a positive impact over time, I hope. Brilliant, thank you. Um, let's take a f quite a few more contributions from the floor. I know a lot of people probably have a lot they want to say. Um, so if we want to start at the back with a gentleman here in the blue and white shirt. Thanks, um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Hill. I'm a member of the Labour Party. Is it? Oh, he's speaking. Sorry about that. I do apologise. A uh, question to Paul. Uh, uh, Charlie Mansell speaking. Um, uh, you mentioned with the evolution of Syriza, possibly because that's ahead of the game in some ways in the, compared to other parts of Europe. I just wondered, you know, if you're saying that many people aren't joining Syriza and the sort of people who now are the Damien Br Br Brides, is therefore Cyprus going to be the sort of Gonzales or Suarez of about 10 years' time? I just wondered if you'd make any observations on how you see the evolution of Syriza. <laughs> when you pass it forward, I will... Um, yeah, just to prove that there are older people in 38 degrees, I'm one of the members, right? Been there for two Yay. or three years. Um, uh, my question to the whole of the panel is um, why or is there a possibility of bringing about <coughs> own agendas but they all share each other's agendas? We're going to see it coming back again as the austerity cuts get harder and more challenging and we've almost feels like we're having almost a year of almost democratic distraction we've got elections in a lot of places we've got to try and fight to defend a bunch of stuff um, but maybe 
Uh, Simon Hill from Ecclesia, we're a left-wing Christian think tank. Um, I wanted to ask about the connection between campaigns and movements built around different issues. We've seen a lot of economic activism in recent years, environmental activism, perhaps before that. Uh, you mentioned, Rowena, that you'd got drawn in by the anti-war movement, as I think many people have. Um, peace activism is still going on. There's a lot of activism around the arms trade, around Trident, but it seems to be getting less attention or be using new methods less. It's less online. There are people doing non-violent direct action mm -hmm. around the arms trade all the time. At any given moment in Britain, there's usually one or two people in prison because of it. But um, perhaps they're not geared up to being online as much. And I wondered if you had thoughts about mm -hmm. that. Also, campaigns for same-sex marriage, which is a, a big issue for many people now, um, danger that it becomes this nice sort of fluffy respectable middle class campaign um, do we need to link in campaigns over LGBT rights, campaigns of same sex marriage with other um, radical issues, see more direct action and more internet activism over it so any thoughts on connection between issues and why some are more prominent with modern methods than, than others thank you Brilliant. there's a, a lady over there at the back as well Hello, um, Val Stevenson from The Pavement, it's a homelessness charity. Um, Spiro, you were saying that um, Occupy may not happen again in its current form. Occupy was interesting for us because you actually welcomed a number of rough sleepers to the camp and it had a very radicalizing effect on some of them. I mean, some mm -hmm. did not feel welcome, but some were very, very radicalized. How, I'd int be interested to hear how other people suggest bringing into campaigns the people who are directly affected, such as rough sleepers who are being shafted royally at the moment. Mm. Um, possibly you could answer that. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. I'll, I'll explain them. Okay. How do you bring the Yeah. Okay. Um, gen oh, sorry, there's a gentleman in a black T-shirt who's been waiting a while here. I mean, I'm not sure that that was a political expression that was going on. It was a social, certainly a social expression of, uh, of, um, uh, of social neglect. But in fact, it only becomes a political expression if, in fact, surely there's a, a hypothesis that they're floating that they're actually wishing to test. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, for most of the social movements that are emerging here, they are not actually testing any particular hypothesis. They, they, they just say, this isn't good enough, we need to do something different without having an agenda. That was certainly the, the position in, in, in Occupy. Uh, by the way, my, the, the, my key thing uh, online is justice for Shrewsbury Pickett. So this is trade union rights, which were uh, come under the hammer 40 years ago, uh, and are under, uh, under the hammer again now. Uh, uh, and uh, if you live in Tottenham, and you're involved in trade union struggles, you have to look at what, uh, you know, what the record of uh, uh, what we've got to fall back on in order to get ourselves out of the jam that we're in. Uh, and and I'm, I'm now starting, the, I'm going to float the idea, I've, uh, so far I've found three people that agree with me, but I think we need a scientific movement rather than a, 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 a social movement because the, ba the, the basis, of, basis of Marx's original critique of, of, of capitalism was that what it does is to legally enshrine the right of shareholders, abstract shareholders, uh, above the needs of the rest of life, the real 
need, you know, the real needs of people and the rest of nature. Now that's, the fact that that's enshrined in capitalism is not debatable. That's what it does. It enshrines the rights of abstract uh, shareholders over everybody else's. Um, that's, what ha that's what happened uh, you know, uh, uh, a long time ago when Parliament accepted the right that all the produce from the land belongs to the landowner, not to the people that actually did the cultivation. <coughs> now, uh, uh, and again, these aren't things that are really debatable. So the question then is, how, what hypothesis do we put in front of humankind that says, well, how do we change that legal framework? And, it, and the problem with the, the socialist movement at the moment it has become a social movement rather than a scientific movement, rather, in other words, based on a bigger one, because then you have a, a, all sorts of he hegemonic relationships between capitalism, because it's better at exploiting the rest of the world than the rest of the world, and wh what's happening is that our system is destroying the rest of the world. Uh, okay, Stephen, can I just ask you to come to a close, because we've got so many questions on this side of the room as well. If Paul, uh, 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 some of the panel could address some of those things. I know it's very big. But, They're uh, big questions. Uh, without these things being addressed, we're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if we come to this side as well, please, this gentleman here. Thank you. An excellent panel discussion. Thank you, Werner and panel. Uh, I would like to. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that is, more, more is that better? Yes, I'm sorry about that. I would like to bring. Uh, I'm a law student, and uh, I would like to particularly bring up that point. There's a thing called shareholder activism which is increasingly coming into mm -hmm. the mainstream media. Now, it's been alluded to, Paul has tiptoed around the uh, fair bit, uh, but it's all about maximization of shareholder dividend, which under English company law is the purpose of the company. Now, actually, where we all agree is that all stakeholders, especially the trade unions, have an uh, important point to say as regards what they view the interest to be, of the company to be. And that's enshrined in law, 172 of the Companies Act. And shelled activism, uh, derivative actions and unfair prejudice actions also provide a more, less sexy, a more legalistic way of approaching uh, a difficult problem. <coughs> Thank you. There's a lady here. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Um, my name is Ruth Hayes. I, I work for a law centre and actually um, I'll contact with Shibby. I'm interested in the point that was raised earlier and Paul's point about in other countries there's been a rootedness of the movements amongst people who are poor and dispossessed and that that doesn't seem to be happening long term here. Uh, and the comment about we haven't yet seen anything like the scale of cuts that are coming through, but they've fallen very unevenly. And daily, you know, there are people who are living on the streets, there are people who are completely destitute, um, there are people who are utterly reliant on donations and the support of other very low income people. So I'm interested in whether, why that hasn't happened here, whether that might happen here. Uh, and I'm also interested in why it is that uh, a number of people who are active in these movements haven't seen the trade union movement as relevant and what it is that trade unions could do differently. I've just come back from a union conference where you know, there must have been at least 200 young people, um, w which seemed to me very successful. So is it just some young people and not others? What's the difference? What could be done differently? Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Gentleman here. I might ask you to respond. Hi there. My name is Joseph Musgrave from the Out for Marriage campaign. And just a quick word on the, that Facebook statistic actually, more people say they earn over 50,000 than actually do, which is <laughs> quite a comment, maybe, <laughs> on social networks. Uh, I'll err on the side of pith, pith here. Um, and it's a broad theme, which is is social media a new way of framing debates or by giving people so many voices, so much more voice? on issues is it perhaps the start of a new game entirely? That's just really my point. Great. Yeah, lady at the back. 
Hi, I'm Deborah. I work on a media reform campaign, and um, we ran a really interesting seminar last Tuesday with Dave Boyle from Co-op UK, and he was talking about cooperative solutions to the media crisis. Um, and you know, cooperation is can be incredibly radical, and it can be the basis of something that you know that challenges everything about capitalism, corporatism, blah blah blah. Uh, but the problem is, is that you know, it takes you said it takes on average two years if you're setting up a co-op. Um, and that's obviously to set up seed funding, also to, um, to set up the governance structures. And that just, you know, it seemed to me if you could bring, we need, uh, we need institutions, uh, the network, network policy drawing together that gap, bridging that gap between the kind of six month campaign that online activists want to do and the two year window. Much. Um, I think that's great. What I'm going to ask is I've, I'm now incredibly pleased to be the chair and not someone who has to make the concluding remarks. I think that it's kind of the same old game, it's human beings and the operation's sometimes good, I think that's true, I think sometimes there are moments in campaigns when if everyone works together in ways it becomes much more apparent that it's a very broad based sort of a movement. Um, uh, this question around some issues are more prominent than others and how can we address that? It's one of the challenges of the 38 degrees model that we do tend to take action on things that most of our members agree on, so forests or the NHS. Um, we never did anything on high-speed rail because our members really just couldn't agree on what they thought about it. So I'd be happy to chat about that afterwards. I've only got about 30 seconds left, probably. Was 2011 a generational moment? Will it come back? I saw um, an Icelandic MP from the movement on a panel last week, and she said that we need to be ready for these moments of crisis because they do come. They come again and again, but the window of opportunity with them is short to make change happen. Um, and so I, I think that, that there will come another moment, and we all need to be ready. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Adam, perhaps you want to go next? Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of similar questions there um, around why it is that um, the most marginalised people aren't included in our movements, why we are a room full of almost all white people of a sort of potentially similar class background. Um, and I think the, there's lots of answers to that, but part of it for me is quite how dire the infrastructure in the UK is and quite how dominated it is dominated it is by massive service delivering charities. So to look for example at Bernardo's, who claim to be the voice of young people in the UK, what have Bernardo's done about the fact that young people in the UK are under massive assault from this government? Go onto their website as they've done and look at their campaign section and the last time I looked at it, it was asking you to sign a petition to the Prime Minister to keep their pledge to end child poverty by 2020. This was last year, the Prime Minister was Gordon Brown. They've got a campaigns team doing absolutely nothing about this. And the reason for that is that if you go onto the homepage of their website, there's a massive button saying commission with us. In other words, privatised to us. Because these huge service delivering charities who've traditionally been the voices of all these groups who are most marginalised, of homeless people, of young people, of often women and so on, have brought <coughs> into this service delivery culture, particularly under the Labour government. And as soon as the Tories have come along and said, well, we're going to cut that service, and either you get to run the service if you shut up and are nice, or we give it to Sodexo, and they've all chosen to shut up and be nice, and there's no one left in the UK. Everyone else who was organising those groups has been squeezed out. So we've ended up with no infrastructure around those people, organising those people, and that's total disaster, and it means we're all flailing and failing, and we need to get on it pretty sharp. Um, the, uh, there was a couple more things. Simon's question um, about why it is that different kinds of movements use different tactics um, is a really interesting one. I think part of it's generational. I think people get involved in activism about between 18 and 21, and they stay campaigning on the same issues for the rest of their lives. That's certainly true of how people vote. You can map how people vote in exactly that way. And people tend to use the tactics they learned about that age. So whatever's cool when you're 21 is basically what you'll carry on doing for the rest of your life. And whatever, <laughs> both in terms of tactics and in terms of issues, and I think that's why you see the peace movement, which tends to be all the people who got involved around the Vietnam War and the first proliferation of nuclear weapons and so on. Um, but I'm sure there's other answers as well, I don't know. And Simon, I, th I think it was again another Simon at the back, will protests come back? Um, I think the difference between now and certainly a lot of the economic crises that have happened over the last 150 years, the last 500 years, is there's not really been any significant attempt to solve the problems that caused it. It was a major crisis at the heart of Western capitalism, a major failure to invest in any serious productive uh, activities in the economy. And it might take two months, it might take two years, it might take 20 years, but that issue is going to come up again. And yes, we are going to see a lot more protests against that again, and I'm looking forward to it. 
<laughs> Brilliant, thank you. At Spiro. Um, yeah, just to, to answer the question about how you bring more people in. And um, um, you, can't, you can't force people to join the social movement. Um, it really has to, uh, um, it, it, it's something that is growing organically. And, um, and what you can do, the only thing you can do is to, to make sure that uh, you have created a space so when people feel like they, they want to be expressed in a democratic way, um, there is a place to go. Uh, now, personally, I believe that in the UK, the UK at the moment, obviously, you know, it's not uh, at the same um, position as Greece or, or Spain, for example. So uh, I don't think we can be expecting um, a big social movement as in, like, as in those countries to, to uh, develop in the next year or so. But obviously, when more and more people are affected by uh, the economic policies, um, there's going to be, you know, they're going to be looking for a, for, a, for a new way to be expressed, and this is this is what we're trying to do at the moment to to make sure that we have created that space. Um, and um, for example, like we see um, how the movement is developing in Spain after the eviction of the uh, the central uh, camp in uh, Madrid, the movement has been decentralised. So we see people um, uh, holding general assemblies once or every uh, once a week or every two weeks. Um, um, people in their communities, in their neighborhoods, becoming more active, uh, talking about the issues they care about, and then escalating those issues. Um, they still have the uh, central working groups, which are uh, comprised by people who uh, have uh, specific skills or interests. So for example, they have the environmental working group, which is more than 150 people, uh, or the education working group, which is, which is basically people who are teachers or, or professors, and they come together and they suggest policies. So we see the movement there developing in a different way. Um, and also in Greece. In Greece, like, it's the same movement. I mean, the, the indignados, occupy, um, many. you know, I'm Greek myself, so obviously I'll be following the, um, the movement there, I've been inspired by it. Um, and how we see it developing now is, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, the Syriza would have never won if it wasn't the only party that actually gains with the Indignados. All the other parties were, uh, uh, you know, they were thinking, they were, their attitude towards, uh, towards that movement was, um, you know, as this gentleman said, oh, there is no clear message, there is no clear direction. Um, and um, Syriza was the only party that engaged with them. And now it's the second party in Greece. Um, and they actually know very well that if they don't stick to uh, to those anti-neoliberal uh, uh, values that they should be representing, that next in the next elections they're going to be down to five percent again, and someone else will be um, the, those those people, those indignants in, in Greece will find um, someone else to express them. So. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's an example of how an horizontal movement uh, can actually um, uh, exercise power, not just in the politics of one country, but even like in the whole Europe. Brilliant. Thank you. Danny. Um, yes, I think that last uh, set of questions was really interesting around this, this idea of structures and thinking about that again. And obviously, that's something we're thinking about a lot as a movement. And I think this idea of how do you engage dispossessed, how do you engage kind of other groups, um, you can cut has been working really closely with DPAC and disabled activists um, and that was really interesting in like we organize an action and we uh, put a meeting place and non-disabled you know uh, kind of accessible station and it was a real wake-up call to the fact that um, we organize together we don't organize in communities as I was saying um, and I think it, it highlights the need for these structures where we do meet these different people that aren't in our kind of silos, and how, how are we going to kind of um, recreate those those structures? Um, and I think it's you know kind of feeds into the point of kind of campaigning on specific issues, which obviously is you know fits our kind of pick and choose consumer choice kind of lifestyle now, um, and makes individual things winnable. But we mustn't um, kind of win the battle and lose the war. So I think with Uncut, we've been very successful on tax avoidance. But the point of that was to highlight an alternative to the cuts. So even if we totally stop tax avoidance, if that money wasn't then ploughed back into safe public services, then we've lost. Um, and it would be easy to see that as a campaign win. But um, uh, so, so how are we going to get back these overall narratives? Um, engaging with the unions, the question over there, like why, why don't we engage with the unions? Unions aren't relevant to me. Uh, we live in a kind of in turbulent times. Young people don't, well, the young people that I talk to, we don't kind of engage with employment in the same it's, it's not so structured and it's not relevant and, and unions have never 
you know, I'm in the in the union building. I don't know how, I don't know how I would relate to to a union in that sense. I think some of the stuff that Unite are doing around the community work is really interesting because that's providing a route for people who couldn't engage via their job um, to get involved. I think that's a really good step forward. Um, I think Adam's actually involved in a really interesting project um, about, actually you'll probably talk about it, about building an economic I social justice. I think I've had my time, so um, okay. about it. About, um, and, and kind of creating an infrastructure around training people around kind of economic issues and building a social justice movement. Um, and I think that's going to be really interesting with a kind of coalition of charities. Um, and yeah, this, this idea of structures and shareholders and cooperatives, I mean, I care about that so much. I think shareholder activism is, is bullshit um, because shareholders only care about their shares and, and, and you know, as, as you kind of talked about, this, this huge problem. Um, uh, legal action, I think, is, is a new avenue to take things forward. We've seen UK Uncut Legal Action kind of springing up and being really successful, um, getting a judicial review against uh, HMRC's treatment of Goldman Sachs. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, Learning more about cooperative structures is going to be really important, and I hope that, um, especially with the stuff we're doing around kind of move your money and engaging people in kind of credit unions, it's using, it's, it's engaging people in those in those cooperative structures, and it's not about, it's because I I agree with Adam. Just as soon as we're just as soon as we just consumer power, then we've really lost, um, and it's about how we engage people on being like active economic citizens, which is a really great term of kind of Harjun Chang's, the, um, the economist. And how do we uh, kind of integrate people in these structures, maybe through their bank account, into belonging to a cooperative identity? And then how do we develop that so that it is about cooperative ownership um, and it's not about external shareholders? Thank you, Danny. And finally, Paul. Um, well, I think, you know, I'll just re-emphasize that, you know, although some people laughed when I said it, that I, I do stand above this as a sort of, as, as, a, as an impartial journalist trying to report it. And that does allow me to try and sometimes say things that will just annoy people and not get me drinks bought uh, by various <laughs> movements that uh, think I'm a decent chap. Um, and I'll try and do that now for, in, for two minutes. Because I think what you two, you two, I think, have, I, I've very much described, I think, the way things are, you know, and, and I think that the strength of horizontalism and the, what you call an ecosystem of organ orgs or organisations is its strength. What you can't do with it, you it can't be led by Jerry Healy, okay, <laughs> rapist, paedophile, Trotskyist leader of the 1980s, okay. It can't be completely infiltrated by the police and then they stage a series of provocations. Uh, that's, how the, that's how the traditional left was, you know, basically defeated in, say, America, the Black Panthers. You know, horizontalism is very strong for that reason. But the other strength of it is that it, it then allows people to do as somebody in the audience says, to fight on what they actually believe in without being asked to believe a lot of other stuff that they don't believe in. Mm -hmm. And that was the experience of the 20th century left. And this generation has just had enough of that. And they're not going to do it again. <coughs> okay? So they are not going to become party soldiers for one monolithic thing, party, movement, or whatever. And it's even true of, of Syriza, which, is a, which you might expect to be, to be evolving in that direction. Okay, but what's the weakness of that? Or what's the problem that that then proposes? It, it, first of all, it means that I think psychologically the reason why people are so attached to this form is, is also because they... They, they, they're preparing themselves to live more or less forever in a world that is ruled by the rich and powerful elite and that they can't do anything about and that therefore they have to survive within. So you can actually still live quite a decent life. Um, I mean, even some of the anarchist anarcho-syndicalist workers who led the um, Milan and Turin occupations of the factories in 1919 survived fascism by living in villages in, in Italy. Okay? You can still li you, you can survive. Uh, under quite repressive situations. Um, and I think that's what the social media does for us in this situation that we don't like. It allows us to carry on, the, or not the illusion, but the reality of a decent life in a world we don't like. But I think those who are waiting for a narrative to emerge that unifies it all together are going to be waiting for a long time. That's, that's the problem. Because the, the, there is, you know, 
You don't see that narrative. My job is to look and, and listen and see whether or not there's an emerging narrative that does link the slum dwellers of Manila with the Arizona, you know, uh, Mexican migrants, with the UK. It doesn't. They don't. There's not one thing. And if you're a social historian or a journalist, say, in 1912, and you did, went to all those places or similar, you would. And the, and the narrative was socialism or, or a form of socialism. Um, and until you, we see that as objectives of observers of the situation, my, my, my provisional judgment on it is it's going to stay like this. It's going to stay like movements resisting and affecting power and not trying to take it. Um, and I think uh, the only thing I, said, I would say is, actually, the movements can be quite effective when they coalesce. Actually, somebody dissed the move on or whatever it's called in America, but the... the, the, the you just see how, how, how powerful the American progressive movements have been, as well as the Tea Party, which is a sort of regressive movement. They're, they're most powerful when they coalesce around one thing. And I think you know, in, in, in America, you'll, you'll, you've seen it happen once already in the mid-decade over migration. Uh, and that was another thing that London citizens did here with illegal migrants. But you'll, I think it's... It's that that you don't see in Britain yet. You don't see a, co a coalescence around one big thing. Um, and I think that I, I would be looking as a journalist for, for the sources of that. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much um, to everyone. I think the topics today that we've been tackling are absolutely huge. I think we've had a great panel and some phenomenal questions. Um, I'm sorry that perhaps we didn't get through to answer all of the questions that were asked, but please do stay and prevent anyone who didn't answer your question from leaving the door until they do, <laughs> apart from Paul who may uh, get violent. Um, and, uh, and there is uh, obviously lunch downstairs and really, really enjoy the rest of your day. It's been a fantastic experience. Please thank the panel and the rest of you. Yeah, 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 yeah.